but a bet on uranium going higher is the easiest bet I've ever made in my life when it comes to investing. Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. We are back for part two of Justin Hewn from UraniumInsider.com. Uh, if you haven't yet watched part one, we'll put a little link in the show notes. Make sure you click on that one first, and it'll take you straight there. And without further ado, Justin Hewn. Okay. Uh, all right. From um, uh, Leonard via YouTube. Do you think the new Swiss uranium fund will have a big impact on spot price? If they raise enough for 3 million pounds and are able to get it on spot, wouldn't this be negative as it appears to be more uranium stock out there than we figured? So this is really interesting. We just had uh, Bram Vanderelst, who's the director of Curzon Uranium Trading, and um, he's going to be doing the uranium trading for this vehicle. So Zuri Invest is raising money right now. They're shooting for $100 million US. Um, I don't know. There's been kind of rumors that that it might be oversubscribed. Uh, the, the folks that are involved with this, including Bram, are like, yeah, we're not telling anybody how much money we've raised because we can't. Uh, we can't talk about this until it's closed. So I don't think there's any validity to those claims as of yet. Uh, we'll have to see how they do. If they can raise $100 million plus million in this capital environment, that's a pretty good sign um, yeah. as far as the appetite for, especially from European investors, for exposure to this commodity. My understanding, talking with Bram, uh, it sounds like there is a good appetite in Europe for this type of vehicle. Um, there's some unique aspects to this vehicle. So one is that they they are committed to buying uranium in the front month. So not going out on the curve to have their buy orders filled. And what that basically means is if they come in for, let's say, 2 million pounds, let's say they raise 100 million US and they can buy almost 2 million pounds. Let's just call it 2 million. They come in for 2 million and there isn't 2 million pounds available for immediate settlement rather than going out and saying, okay, let's settle in uh, August, they just raise their bid. They raise their bid until it gets filled. Oh. That's different than how SPUD has been operating. Um, my understanding is SPUD primarily has been buying for front month settlement, but during a couple periods of time when the capital was really flowing, you know, they're raising $100 million a day. Uh, for you know a day here a day there where they raise that much but you know 50 to 100 million they're raising on a daily basis for a couple of weeks in a row um september 2021 april 2022 and um the spot price really went went crazy but there was a point where they were buying so much that they couldn't get filled in the front month period at any price so they had to go out on the curve right i don't think they've gone beyond let's say 6 months on the forward curve but still to only buy for immediate settlement is sort of part of their mandate. Hmm. So that, that could be interesting. Um, the spot market dynamic, it's, it's still very tight. Um, there's not a lot of liquidity in the spot market. So I think if they come in for two to 3 million pounds, we're going to see the price move. I don't think it's going to be a $5 jump. I'm only saying that because Sput hasn't been in there for uh, two months at this point, And we have, they're not the only buyer. There's traders in the spot market right now. Cameco's in the spot market. To some extent, utilities are sort of dabbling there, but not a lot. Um, what? But we do have primary production that does get sold into the spot market. That comes from uh, BHP, from Olympic Dam. It comes from the Uzbeks and a couple of traders. So uh, there might be a few million pounds of liquidity there. So that initial purchase, I don't know how much it's going to move the spot price, but I believe that it will if they raise the, uh, you know, their goal. If it doesn't, I'm not really concerned. Um, what sort of effect this is going to have on the spot price has everything to do with capital flows in a similar way to SPUT. Now, the difference with SPUT is they can only raise money when they're at a premium to NAV. So even as there's money constantly flowing in and out of that vehicle in the open market, they can't raise any cash unless they're at a premium to nav. So if they're trading at a persistent discount, it can trade all the volume it wants until that thing moves back up to a premium to nav. They're not raising any more money because that'll be diluted to their shareholders. This other, this new vehicle, the AMC, um, that's always at nav because they're not trading on the open market. So you can actually buy and sell um, a position in this vehicle 
through your broker. Now, the U.S. investors cannot yet, but they're working on that. They're dealing with the SEC. And from my understanding, it's not a walk in the park. Um, but international investors, through their broker, there's an ISIN number. They can actually buy and sell via their, their brokerage for international investors outside of the U.S. Um, they will not be trading uranium. So it's a buy and hold. But if you, as an investor who has a position in this vehicle, go to redeem your position or part of your position, there's kind of three steps. The first is they will attempt to cross that sale with a purchase order to kind of, you know, uh, negate, uh, negate each other. Um, if there isn't a purchase order uh, kind of in line to uh, to balance out your sell sale, then they will actually um, go into their cash balance and they will carry a cash balance only to the extent that they don't have enough cash on hand to buy a minimum lot of uranium, which is 100,000 uh, 100, pounds. Other than that, they do not hold cash. They don't want any sort of tracking error. Cash comes into them, they buy uranium. So unless they have less than enough cash to buy a hundred thousand pounds. Okay. So if they have cash that is insufficient to buy a hundred thousand pounds on their balance sheet and you go to redeem and there's cash that will sufficiently redeem your position comes out of the cash balance. If there's no buy order or insufficient cash for that redemption, then they'll sell some uranium to raise the cash to redeem your position. So that's kind of how the vehicle works. And like I said, the effect it'll have on the spot market is entirely dictated by flows. But the fact that they can buy any time that has nothing to do with the premium or discount to NAV, I think it's going to have a decent effect. I think we're going to see some capital flowing. I don't think we're going to see $100 million a day. Um, I don't know how much this vehicle, because it doesn't trade on the open market, is going to be affected by risk on, risk off, risk on, risk off kind of thing. But it's absolutely a positive. I think the market is not giving it uh the sentiment is so bad that the market is not expecting it to be much of a thing and i think that's an error i i ha i think it's going to have an effect yeah yeah i think anyone that's taking the uh, stuff off the market and not putting it in a uh, power plant is good for our bet <laughs> for sure for sure uh okay from twitter awful thoughts will the restart of uh, Converdine this year kick off more contracting for U308 as conversion is booked, or is that already pre booked well ahead of the restart capacity? I don't think it's going to have a huge effect, um, only because uh, they've been they've been contracting for future conversion capacity prior to the plant actually reopening. You know, the process of of getting it reopening. Um, or reopened has allowed them to contract out for future capacity. Um, and I, to my understanding is they're going to start at around 50% total capacity and ramp up the full capacity. And a lot of the near term conversion capacity that'll be online from this facility is already kind of booked out. So I don't think it's going to have a huge effect for spot conversion, but more conversion capacity come on, coming online for the future. And you know, you go out three, four, five years, there's definitely capacity from this, from this facility. So if you're signing an enrichment contract and for 2027 um, delivery, you're going to be signing conversion for 2025, 2026. You got to buy uranium to feed into that. So overall positive that we have more Western conversion capacity coming online. I don't think it's going to have a huge, a huge short-term effect. Okay. Okay. Yeah. They, they convert the, um, uh, uranium hexafluoride, right? The they convert the uranium oxide, the U three hundred eight, into uranium hexafluoride into the gas, so that it can be enriched in the centrifuges. Yeah, and that that company's here in the U.S. in um, Illinois, I think. They're in Illinois. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, Jan asks, do Japanese restarts require an initial core load? Maybe you can give us the kindergarten version of what initial core load is. I, I don't even know what that is. Uh, initial core load. So when you have a new reactor um, starting, uh, getting its first criticality and getting ready to connect to the grid, you have to load the the reactor core with fresh fuel. Okay. So just the fuel that it operates on. Um, and an initial core load is usually twice, uh, between two to three times of an average 
um, of an average core reload. So for example, that initial core will, uh, you, you, if, if you've got a one gigawatt capacity reactor, that initial core load will be close to a million pounds of uranium equivalent of fuel. Um, and so, and possibly more, uh, depending on the reactor design, which I'm not a nuclear engineer, but that's my understanding. And then, you know, 18 to 24 months into the process, and then every 18 to 24 months out until the reactor is decommissioned, roughly a third of the reactor core will be taken out and put into the cooling pools and eventually put into long-term storage and replaced with, with fresh fuel. Um, so yeah, my understanding is the reactors that were decommissioned or let's say uh, put into care and maintenance in Japan either have the fuel actually uh, removed from the plant or had ran that fuel down uh, to such an extent that they'll they'll need initial core loads again. Um, but a lot of a lot of the reactors coming back online are being operated by utilities that likely expected their reactor to come online again at some point in the future. So uh, are likely sitting on that initial core load. I don't think the restarts are going to cause um, immediate short-term demand for uranium or any other element of fuel cycle for that matter. But to the extent that they are online, then those reactors are going to have to, the reactor operators are going to have to contract for those uh, core core reloads and, and fuel obviously going out into the future. So short term, not a huge effect, but we do know that some Japanese utilities are already signing new uh, contracts uh, across the fuel cycle. So uh, was she asking pretty much like it, it takes more to to jumpstart these things and get them going, which might create a little spike in demand or something? Yeah, I, mean, I don't expect it to create a spike in demand um, because if your reactor is in the process of being restarted and you expect it to be restarted, you don't wait until that decision to secure that fuel. Yeah. So yes. reactors that are going to restart this year and next year and 2025, uh, even 2025, those operators likely already have the fuel on hand for okay. that. Yeah. But of course, if they expect to be operating for another 20 years, they're going to have to come to the market. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this one's from KP from Twitter. It sounds, uh, uh, it, it's funny sentiment, you know, I, uh, I kind of feel the same way about, uh, since I've been following precious metals, you know, sentiment, when, when, when the price of the metal is down, everyone thinks it's a terrible bet. And then, you know, once it shoots to the moon, then everyone thinks it's wonderful instead of the other way around. Uh, he says, uh, why do the hedge funds not seem to understand the thesis? They can fund independent research and find out what you've been talking about uh, all these years, meaning you, Justin. Um, where do you think is the breakdown in their line of thinking versus your understanding of the sector? I don't necessarily think there's a breakdown in line of thinking. I think it's it's literally a matter of liquidity. So, um, you know, the, some of the smaller funds that are invested in the resource space and or uranium, they definitely get it. So when I say a smaller fund, you know, even if we're talking about Segra or Sachem Cove, you know, combined those two funds, I think have five or 600 million invested in the uranium space. Um, then we've got Old West based in California. We've got L2 in Brazil. We've got uh, Tribeca, um, which I believe is in Australia. And there's a handful of other funds that, that get it and are invested. It's just such a small story. And it's such a small space. So we tend to be in somewhat of an echo chamber. For whatever reason, uranium investors in a similar vein to gold and silver investors are very uh, emotional creatures and very excitable. Um, and we we consume content around this space voraciously. So the thesis becomes so clear to us that we're questioning like, why does everybody not get this? And why is everybody not buying this right now? Right? I mean, that's that's kind of the line of thinking. But really, it's a matter of liquidity. So for example, a few weeks ago, when we had, let's see, when was that big S&P dump? Um, looking at the charts on my other screen here. So this was uh, second week of March, we had big dump in the broad market, big dump in uranium equities, um, with the banking crisis, right? So when that happened, we know for sure there were a couple of funds, one in particular, mid-sized fund with you know a few billion AUM that had major exposure to some of these banks and also held uranium stocks. So they had to de-risk. And when the margin calls come, you sell what you have. It doesn't matter how good the story is. 
So a lot of this just has to do with general market sentiment, general liquidity. It's like, oh, well, Justin, the S&P is melting up and our stock's still selling up. Yeah, it's melting up, but look at the volumes, look at the liquidity, the liquidity is still insufficient. Um, and we're there's still not line of sight. And I think that's really what large investors need to pile into investments is line of sight. Um, and if you're managing hundreds of millions, if not billions, you're not just looking at line of sight on the nuclear space. Like you can maybe take a tiny, tiny position. And there's a lot of funds that do have small positions, but you're not going to make a chunky position until the liquidity is sufficient. So depending on your AUM, you might have to take a minimum size position in order to that actually to even move the needle for you, right? So if you're managing a billion dollars and you take a uh, a one percent position that's 10 million uh 10 million what can you buy in this space without actually moving it with that size position almost nothing um and you got to be able to get out so you have to look at daily trading volume for the vehicles that you're going to be buying and uh that volume is going to have to have some metric relative to the size of your position to allow you to even buy in the first place so it's not how good is the story why don't they get it it's why it's the size of the space and the liquidity and i think when when markets in general and investors in general have line of sight on on rate hikes, when they hear what they need to hear from the Fed, when they um, when they understand sort of a little bit better the direction uh, in terms of money supply and liquidity, QE, QT, all of that, then I think we'll see some risk come back on. And then I also think there's a decent amount, uh, unless you've done a lot of work in the space, right? So if you've listen to 20 different interviews from myself and other folks in the space that are that are doing similar type of uh, uh of media appearance and so that's uh, you know John Chapaglia from Sprott um uh etc cetera, etc cetera. like the list goes on right unless you really understand the thesis you've done a lot of reading you've done a lot of listening you 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 get it you just kind of see this market that's small and is sort of uh, sort of slowly bleeding out you saw the uranium price hit $64 a year ago and now we're sitting at 51 you know what happened? So if you don't get the story and you see, oh, well, it hit here, but we're still down here, that is your story. And the price action on the screen becomes the story. So you either are a contrarian and you're doing the work to understand the value proposition here, or you're not. And most people are not contrarians. Most people are momentum speculators. Okay. Um, they're not long-term investors. They're not looking for value. They're not looking for the, a five to 10 year thesis. You know, they're looking to chase the shiny object. Where's the volume? Where is the, you know, where's the short squeeze of the day? Um, and that's, and volume begets volume, size begets size. And so what we're likely going to see is a slow accumulation by retail and maybe some smaller funds over the past six months, which has been happening. I know for a fact, the funds that are focused on uranium have been buying relatively aggressively during this period of time. Um, and once we see volumes come in and, and that volume stick and the spot price start to move again, then that's just going to have the snowball effect where we'll, we'll see, we'll see the market come in. We know, you know, John Chapagla, the CEO of Sprott, he'll, he'll talk about, um, discussions that he's had with investors that are, have multiple billions, tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions in assets under management that get it. They just can't touch it. They can't touch it until you're going to see $50 million a day being traded in spot. Um, and until you see that, anybody managing that kind of money, they, they can't, it doesn't matter how, how, uh, how golden the story is. They just, they can't, they physically can't do it until it's larger. So once it's larger, it's that size is going to bring on more size. We're just in that risk off period where we need line of sight. We need the spot price to move. And it's too small for funds of, of reasonable size to even touch it. And retail is exhausted here. So um, once that spot price starts to move, you know, I tweeted this out over the weekend, I think, or last week, I think um, just judging by the washout that we've seen over the past six months and the sentiment in the retail space when it comes to uranium, I think, you know, all of these people or most of them understand the story. They like yeah. the story. They believe it. They believe in the future of nuclear. They think uranium is going much higher. They just can't take the pain anymore. And yeah. once it starts to move, they're going to come back and they're going to be buying this stuff higher. Um, it It's not unique to uranium. This is just how markets work. Everybody loves it at the top and hates it at the bottom. Look at look at trading volumes for ARKK and, and you'll get it. 
Um, <laughs> all of the bullion came in at the top 20% of that, of that uh, uh, ETF. So yeah. it's just how it goes. It's, yeah, it's it human psychology and it'll never change. And I yeah. can't change it. You can't change it. Uh, it's just how it is. I'm going to, I'm going to, hopefully I can put your mind at ease here, KP. I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen here with the, uh, uh, Sprott, uh, with the spot and we can see right here, net asset value as of today is, uh, 12, 1276, but it only costs you 1129. And I think, uh, before we started uh, clicking on here, I checked the price, uh, and it was even cheaper than that. So this is a good deal. Uh, you know, this is the time to buy premium discount, right? 11 and a half percent. It's probably even better today. Um, you know, take that for what it's worth. This is the time to be buying, <laughs> not selling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like, I, I don't know if things will go lower from here in the short term, but I certainly can tell you that, you know, a few weeks back when we had, we had the RSI, I mean, falling off the screen. Oh yeah. That was such a screaming buy for me. Oh man. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and who knows where it's going to go from here in the short term, but certainly when equities are discounted 40 to 60% from their high print 18 yeah. months ago, that's not when you should be selling if you believe in this story. So yeah, um, uh, yeah I a hundred percent agree with you. And yeah, the spot vehicle, I mean, when it's at a 10 plus percent discount to NAV, certainly a value proposition. And that's something that you're not going to get from the other, uh, the, from the Zuri Invest AMC as well. And while they can basically guarantee you that when you do sell your position, you'll be able to sell it at NAV. Uh, you know, so that's something you can't do. If you're trying to get out of spot right now, well, you got to sell it at 11% discount to NAV. You bought it at NAV. Maybe you're still up on your position if you bought it earlier, but um, if you believe spots going back to a premium and again, and one day will again trade at NAV and buy more uranium, then it's obviously a, a great value proposition at the, at a big discount to NAV. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think so. And um, yeah, last week when, uh, or maybe it was the week before last, I had limit orders that were hitting just playing the beta and you are an M, you know, it was, it was pretty awesome. It's I'm hoping we get like a triple bottom coming up here, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, RSI is looking decent across the board. Um, it, it looks like it could be a bottoming pattern, but again, I don't know if we see some sort of liquidity flush, some sort of other event that's triggered by whatever. Um, that's entirely possible. But as far as spot goes, as far as uranium goes, I mean, where the equities are going to go in the short term, I have no idea. But a bet on uranium going higher is the easiest bet I've ever made in my life when it comes to investing. This is the risk reward here is stupid. Could it trade at a bigger discount to NAV? Sure, it could. Um, we've historically hit, I think, 18%. You know, you know, so it could yeah, go. I remember that day. <laughs> the risk is super off. Yeah. I yeah. sent you a screenshot with a little heart drawn around it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, like, I, there's some technical analysts that I highly, highly respect that are trying to, that are saying that, you know, they, they expect this, but um, the price of uranium to correct and come back into the mid thirties, I'm just like, it's not happening. Sorry. It's just not happening. I mean, it would take, it would take an unexpected event for that to happen. Um, if we continue as we are now, no, we're, we're sitting, you know, 1% above what I think is the floor. Yeah, I would be very surprised to see us even go back down to the mid 40s ever again. Uh, maybe after a long term bull market and we go super risk off for some unforeseen reason, but the price is only going higher. Yeah, very, very minimal downside. I mean, for uranium here, I would say there's a 5% downside and 100 to 150% upside. And that's being conservative. That's if financial players don't get a hold of this thing and squeeze the hell out of it. And that's entirely possible. It's not my thesis, but the vehicles are there to support it happening. So if yeah. they get a hold of it, that's what's going to happen. We're yeah. going to see 150 to $200 uranium and the financial guys get, get if they smell blood and go after it, that's what's going to happen. But we're not betting on it. That's just certainly there. I think- yeah. Right on. Higher than 0% chance of that happening. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Above zero. Right on. Well, thank you, Justin, for coming uh, back on the show. This is a lot of fun. If you want to check out all things Justin, go to uraniuminsider.com, subscribe to his newsletter, and check it out. Justin, thanks again, and you have a great rest of the day, sir. Always my pleasure, Steve.